Why would I want to use SignalR? Why wouldn't I, especially with WebSockets being so prevalent, just start programming WebSockets instead? Uh, have you ever programmed against WebSockets? I, I, I have, and it's a bit of a clunky experience. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. SignalR is not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there's your, there's your first answer. Uh, the second answer is you will find some clients and some servers out there who, for insert reason here, don't support WebSockets. Uh, you know, somebody might have an old browser. Um, it still happens, believe me. Um, uh, also, uh, some lower level devices don't necessarily support WebSockets. So like there are some smaller devices, watches, et cetera, et cetera, who might not have support for, you know, first class support for WebSockets. So in those cases, they would back off and they would use something like long pole. Um, I found that this usually works better with a set of slides that I brought, which okay. you know, is such a PM move, but do you mind if I pull up <laughs> Not slides? at all. Okay. Go for it. Okay, cool. Let me let me hit this real quick. Now I've only got two monitors. Um, and I think I think that's on the right monitor. So if yep. you feel free to just speak and interrupt me because I won't see you. So that's fine. Okay. <laughs> so, real quick, like kind of a crash course in what signal art is. Uh, so I want to go ahead and just click through a couple of slides. Uh, so this is kind of your, your long polling idea. So in SignalR, the first thing we would do is we would do a negotiation, uh, which this is all over the SignalR documentation. I'll give you a link for that later. Um, and and uh, essentially what we do is the client will reach out to the server and do a negotiate request. The server, you know, ASP.NET Core server, will basically tell it whether or not it supports WebSockets. So if it doesn't support WebSockets, what we do is we, you know, we go ahead and we start up with long polling. You know, it's kind of like WebSockets are first, then we'll try server sent events, and if either one of those don't work, then we back up and we try long polling because long polling is, you know, it's a request response model. So in long polling, essentially what happens is, this, you know, client would make a, you know, request to the server, server's going to, you know, fire an event make a response, and then immediately the client's going to make another request. You know, you've probably done this, you know, er, er, early on before we had WebSockets, before we had SignalR. Um, and this is really like your MetaEquiv refresh or like a JavaScript refresh, or, you know, you just make a series of Ajax calls and like, you know, a schedule. So we've all had to do this kind of thing before. Um, at one point, uh, it got better. And we had the concept of server sent events, in which case you could just create a new event source. And then whenever an event happens on the server, it actually sends a message back out to the client. Um, you know, this is kind of your, your, you know, if you don't have WebSockets, you want to have SSE, you know. Um, but, you know, long, long polling is always going to be your, you know, your all the way back off. Um, but in the perfect world, uh, you know, your client and your server would both have WebSockets. And in WebSockets, basically what happens is, you know, you make that negotiate request. The server says, I support WebSockets. You're good. Uh, the client says, cool, I'd like to upgrade this connection and make it a WebSocket connection. Uh, the moment it does that, it switches protocols to WebSockets, and now you are partying in real time. And now all the messages just continue to go back and forth. So this is kind of like most times with your new browsers, this is what you're going to see uh, because of the fact that, you know, most clients and servers actually already support, you know, you know this kind of an experience. So um, one thing I'd like to point out, though, is like, it's always fun when you can see what you can do with it. Um, so let me kind of show you just kind of a silly little 3D demo that I've got here. Um, and what I'll do is I'll pull open uh, a quick little quick little uh, thing right here. And what I'll do is I'll drag this over. And um, I know you've got some JavaScript uh, watchers out there. So you know you won't, you won't want to look at my JavaScript code and Gratuitous detail, <laughs> not that great at it. We'll get to that later. Um, but this is essentially kind of a 3D rendering or you know, so a, a 3D you know, series of images stitched together using 3JS, which is a fantastic like 3D uh, kind of JavaScript engine. And what I can do with this is go like this, which is pretty neat. Mm. You know, it looks great on screen. You know, basically I have this pane here and the pane kind of shows you know, all the different images around. Essentially this is just a series of images that just get kind of stitched, stitched all together. Um, now, what I also have is a control panel, and what I'll do is I'll copy this out and just paste this in and just go to controls, and I'm not going to do it here because I want to be able to kind of, I want you to be able to see what's going on on my screen. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll show you that I've actually got that pulled up on my phone. I don't know if you can see that very well, uh, but I've kind of got the same thing, and I've got an X, Y, and Z slider. So what I'll do is now I'll grab one of those sliders. Let me refresh it and connect again. I grab one of those sliders, and you can see as I move the X slider around, 
we're actually spinning that on an X axis. When I spin the Y slider around, we're spinning it on a Y axis. And the JavaScript code that I have is old enough that the gyroscope part no longer works because a lot of those APIs have been deprecated. So I have to get back into the code and like update that. But eventually what I'll be able to do is show you how I can take my phone and go like this and that plane will move around. Um, but I'm using kind of some old JavaScript uh, APIs in there that don't really exist anymore. Um, but what I can do is just pull that other page back up again. And what I can do here is just kind of pull this off to the side and we'll get a couple of these panels open up. Um, if I pull that one over here and just kind of do a new browser right here. Um, what you'll see is that for each one of these connected clients, whenever I use this control panel, they're all going to move. So that's kind of what SignalR is for. It's for those like interactive experiences where you've got multiple browsers across multiple users, maybe in different places like we are right now. And the idea is that you could actually use SignalR so that when something happens, when an event fires, when somebody does a send or an invoke on this side, uh, we actually have code over here that literally looks like on and then the event name and then how to process it. So if you've ever done like a lower level WebSocket programming, you know, that's not what it looks like. Um, so this is sort of a, a hyper simplification of that. Um, it's also something that, you know, you have to give uh, David and Damien a lot of respect. They kind of have this ability to like see into the future. And like one thing that David said at one point was like, do you think WebSockets is going to be the last thing? It's like, of course not. He goes, well, if you're using SignalR, it won't matter because we'll just add whatever the new thing is to it and it'll keep working. So that's one of the reasons for, for SignalR, you know, in the, in, you know, the early days, it was because we lacked WebSockets support. Uh, today, it's because like WebSockets is probably not going to be the, the the last thing that we do to enable real time on the web. So if you're programming against SignalR at the point where we add it in, and I'm not saying that we're going to do this. Like, let me just get that out there very quick. Just give you a random idea. Uh, I'm not saying we're doing this. I've, I've pitched it in the team room, and they throw things at me. So I, I don't know if this will ever come. But if you can imagine something like SignalR over gRPC, uh, again, not proposing that we're doing that or SignalR over HTTP3 or whatever protocol gets invented next month. Um, uh, you know, that's where, you know, the the abstraction layer of SignalR becomes pretty valuable. You know, at, at that point, you can kind of do more stuff with it.